Everybody wants to focus on the root cause of the problem. The root cause of the problem is what's happening on the border. The impact of that problem is felt in the rest of the country. Do you have any plans to visit the border? I, at some point, you know, I, we are going to the border. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I, and I haven't been to Europe. She doesn't want photographs and video TV footage of her standing next to the big problem. 178,000 human beings were stopped. These are encounters in April. Just in April, more than 178,000 migrants encountered at the border. If that many people were going through, I bet there's 178,000 plus who made it. And yet, deportations last month we're at an all-time low, less than 3,000 people deported last month, and yet she is continuing to say, as is the administration, that if you come, you will be turned back. In fact, reality is they're not being turned back by and large. To folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border, do not come. You could cut and paste some of those words from language I would have used or President Trump would have used, but the difference is not words, it was actions that we took that took, turned the magnet off, that, that closed our southern border, that secured it in a way that protected American sovereignty. The vice president outlined an economic plan to invest $4 billion in Guatemala and the Northern Triangle countries to create jobs and decentivize mass migration. With an additional $310 million already committed towards humanitarian relief and food insecurity. This one's a man-made crisis. This is policy driven. The administration could stop this surge at the border in a heartbeat by simply reverting to the policies that were in place on January 20th of this year. The data supports that, and I think Americans are going to demand it. The fact of the matter is until you go down there and actually see what's going on and correct it, it's not going to change. Senator Joe Manchin facing massive backlash after breaking from his own party in an editorial and then with his multiple appearances over the sweeping election overhaul bill. I think it's the wrong piece of legislation to bring our country together and unite our country, and I'm not supporting that because I think it would divide us further. His vote would be important if he also was voting to override the filibuster because that's what that's what it would take to first to, to get to the next step of actually passing uh, this federal takeover of our voting systems. In a Sunday op-ed in the West Virginia Gazette Mail, Senator Manchin writes, quote, I believe that partisan voting legislation will destroy the already weakening binds of our democracy. And for that reason, I will vote against the For the People Act. Furthermore, I will not vote to weaken or eliminate the filibuster. Joe Manchin says he doesn't like S-1 because of, of these provisions that are in it, but he does like the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. The voting rights bill is intact. The law extends well into the future. What this rewrite of it does is grant to the Justice Department almost total ability to determine the voting systems of every state in America, which they're trying to do directly through H.R. 1. So you're going to end up with the bill in the United States Senate that is named the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, but the substance is mainly going to be the S-1 bill, and it's going to be specifically on the voting provisions. He opposes this as it stands, but he's not against the provisions we're talking about. And he's put forward what he would support, which, again, as Stan said, could be a very quick name change and maybe a couple small provisional changes. So we've got to watch this very carefully, folks. It's not done yet. President Biden on the world stage, his first foreign trip since taking office. This being the first major overseas trip by President Biden. These serious issues uh, that, that could be addressed uh, and should be addressed. I will say that he's been getting ready for 50 years. Um, he has been on the world stage. He's known a number of these leaders for decades. These countries are taking the measure of a new president. They're now getting to see him as America's commander in chief and the individual that can deliver American greatness to support them. And so they're trying to figure out precisely what he's thinking. North Korea greeted the new administration in March by firing missiles into the Sea of Japan. That same month, China mocked and humiliated the U.S. delegation at a summit held on U.S. soil. I really feel like the, the looming threats of Iran and China and even Hamas maybe loom over this whole trip. The White House has reopened talks with Tehran over the Iran nuclear deal, which some experts say will increase the chances of a future war between Iran and Israel. 
and it resumed hundreds of millions of dollars in USA to the Palestinians. The president says that one of the main purposes of the trip is to express solidarity with allies, but I just don't know how you can do that when you're pursuing a renewed deal with Iran, uh, given the current posture in China, and then even the emboldening of Hamas. How does he pull that off? How does he convince allies that they are indeed the focus, given the posture he has in other places of the world? There's been no area where they have messed it up worse than in foreign policy. Uh, in, in just five months, it has been a litany of foreign policy disasters, one after the other after the other. Other Europeans understand that Iranian assassination campaigns, Iranian terror, the attacks on Israel from Hamas funded by Iran, that those are things that are bad for them. And so you'll see a split even inside of Europe and how they respond to President Biden's posture with respect to both Iran and to China. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar back in the news again because of what she said. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar backpedaling after comparing the U.S. and Israel to terrorist organizations. Tweeting, we have seen unthinkable atrocities committed by the U.S., Hamas, Israel, Afghanistan, and the Taliban. Twelve Jewish Democrats signed a letter saying her words reflected deep-seated prejudice and that, quote, equating the United States and Israel to Hamas and the Taliban is as offensive as it is misguided. I think that it's a really dangerous and that she should be called out consistently when she's trying to blame America first for the world's problems. She, she's lost her perspective. She is failing the, the most basic test that every member of Congress should have, and that should be that America should be the top priority. She is elected to represent her constituents. She can do that. Uh, that does not give her the right, though, to just sit on the Foreign Affairs Committee. That's a choice Democrat leadership makes. They could take her off that seat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee immediately. And Jordan, they could do one of two things. I mean, I think probably most appropriate, they could put her on no committee. Several of Congresswoman Omar's closest allies on Capitol Hill defended her. And uh, Omar herself released this statement clarifying what she meant, saying in part, quote, to be clear, the conversation was about accountability for specific incidents regarding those international criminal court cases, not a moral comparison between Hamas and the Taliban and the U.S. and Israel. Her clarification was, I just want the, basically the U.S. to be subject to ICC uh, jurisdiction, which which we've done a lot, a lot of work at the ICC. You don't want anyone to be subject to ICC jurisdiction. If Nancy Pelosi is serious that she shouldn't be drawing these moral equivalencies, don't put her on the committee that provides oversight over that issue. Her group, that squad, whatever you want to call that, they know it's much more important that she's on that committee than just a member of Congress.